Welcome to the seventh in our series of professorial inaugural lectures. I'm Jules Pretty, I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor. I'm just going to be introducing Nick and then hand over to him in a moment. Um, just as a reminder, these are a series of special events to celebrate the research undertaken by our recently appointed professors. The uh, University of Essex is ranked ninth in the UK for the quality of our research, and we're very, very proud of that and very proud of the, of the research that is being done that, in a way, um, it really matters for the world, changes the way that we see things and do things. And it's been a, been a pr privilege to have leading global thinkers at the university in this series of lectures uh, that has covered work in sociology, law, literature, government, and earlier in the data archive. Uh, Professor Nick Allen, uh, first of all, a comment about the department. The Department of Sociology was recently ranked in the QS World University rankings as the 24th um, of sociology departments in the world. So it's a terrifically um, a good thing to have Nick coming to speak to us so soon after that. Nick did his PhD and earlier masters at the London School of Economics. Came to Essex in 2008. His research interests include the public understanding of science, the social psychology of risk, social and political trust, and survey methodology to help us understand those sorts of things. As part of his current research projects, Nick works with colleagues in the Institute for Social and Economic Research here, also in the Department of Sociology, of course, as well as with academic colleagues around the world, um, including in Germany and India, notably at the moment. Uh, one of his current research projects is with the Wellcome Trust and involves looking at how the public perceives and engages with biomedical science at a time of just tremendous growth of understanding and of data sets. Um, that will tell us about the kind of information we carry around with us, but then how we make informed choices about possibly even our personalized health care in future. Um, this will further our understanding of the social and psychological bases of public attitudes, beliefs, and knowledge about medical science. So really at the edge of very important stuff. The title of tonight's lecture is What People Know About Science um, and Why It Matters. Uh, at the end of the lecture, Nick and I will repair in our usual way to the fireside over here and have a little chat and take questions and, and comments from the audience. And then everyone is very welcome to join us for drinks in the cafe um, upstairs. So uh, with uh, no further ado, I'd like to warmly welcome Nick to give us your professorial inaugural lecture. Thanks very much. Well, thanks, <coughs> thanks Jules, and thanks everyone uh, for coming. Um, on this cold or not quite so cold Monday evening. Um, it's a great honour to be asked to do this lecture, although when I was asked to do this lecture back in June, I thought, oh, I wish I didn't have to do that. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know they've given me a professorship. Why do I actually have to do a lecture as well? But I mean, and then I sort of quickly realised, no, of course, of course not. Um, so I'm actually very, very happy to be giving this lecture. And as, as uh, Jules said, I work mainly in the public understanding of science and why people differ in their attitudes to science and technology in different ways. And, and so today I'll, I'll talk about a, a bit of an introduction to this area of research and then I'll, in the second half of what I say, I'll talk about a little bit about what I've done uh, in that area myself. Now, as Jules says, I've been here for uh, six years and it's been a great time and I've really kind of been able to do lots of what I wanted to do and, and collaborate with colleagues in sociology and at ISA and government, and it's, it's a great university for social science. Um, and last year I applied for this uh, professorship, and, and, and luckily I, you know, I, I got it, and so I'm, I'm here today. But I've not actually always been an academic. Um, and I did wonder whether I needed to say something about that on my uh, CV, in my uh, application form. And I, I decided not to, but I kind of worked out an alternative CV just in case, so if it, if it, if it all gone wrong, I, mean, I could have substituted a different, um, a different kind of application uh, this year. So, um, and I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about that as, as background. So before academia, I was actually a rock and roll musician. Um, that's me there. <laughs> so I spent lots of time kind of perhaps wasting time, uh, but I did, I did develop some kind of CV, and I thought, well, maybe I could talk about that. So in 1987, I made a record with the Triffids, and that was, a, uh, that was quite a nice, a nice thing to do, a nice research output. Is it impact, something like that? I'm not sure. 
1990, another one, 1992, another one, and there were several in between, uh, 2003, and I've actually continued to make uh, some music uh, since then. And in fact, in 2010, one of my colleagues who's here in the, in the audience uh, collaborated with me on this, on this record. And I even managed to make one last year as well. Now, that was sort of a bit of my alternative CV. There was a worrying gap in published output between 92 and 2003, when I was doing this sort of PhD business, um, which I wasn't sure how I would play. But anyway, so I didn't need to, but as I thought I'd prepared it, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of let you see it anyway. Um, but I was also thinking about these, uh, there's lots of talk these days about metrics, citation indices, H indices, and these, for people who don't know, these are ways of measuring the number of citations you get to your published articles. So I was thinking, well, what could I say about that? So I, I came up with some, some alternative ones. And single of the week, NME, number one. So I thought that perhaps that would be a citation that I could use. Um, top 10 in the indie charts, 1990. Does that count for my impact as an impact case? Um, or maybe album of the year for Hot Press Island in 1990. Um, actually uh, above the Pet Shop Boys, which was quite a nice touch. <laughs> anyway, you're allowed to laugh at this because I don't really mean it. I mean, I'm not really going to in introduce this as part of my, my academic presentation. <clears throat> OK, so let's get back to what I do now, uh, which is thinking about what people know about science and why does it matter if it does matter. Um, much of my work has been in this area of public understanding of science and attitudes towards technology. And there's been lots of research in this area, clearly before me, really since the late 1970s uh, in, in the US. And in the UK, the Journal of Public Understanding of Science was per first published in 1992, and that was edited by John Durant, who was actually a, a historian, I think, uh, by training. And since then, there's been a stream of research looking at public understanding of science, risk perception, beliefs, knowledge about science and technology. We often uh, kind of refer to science and technology as almost the same thing. It's really not the same thing, although it has to be said for the public at large, it, it really is quite, there's not so much differentiation. But an early concept in this field that I got interested in uh, doing my graduate work at LSE was this idea of science literacy. So I'm going to say a little bit about science literacy and what that means <clears throat> and, and then go on to say how we can perhaps study it and how people have, have studied it. So that's Sputnik 1, which was launched uh, 4th of October 1957. And just happened chance, the first save survey of public attitudes to science and technology in the US happened just, just prior to this, just a few months prior. So uh, Sputnik went up, and then they were able to do a follow-up survey, and this was reported in uh, Public Opinion Quarterly in 1959. And what it revealed was distressingly low levels of scientific understanding amongst the US public. And the chief concern and worry about this was that uh, well, you know, they wanted to maintain support for, for science because there's a space race. Well, essentially, it was against the Soviet Union and they wanted, uh, the US wanted a, a, a literate workforce who could, who could be the, you know, the sort of scientific and technological powerhouse of the US. So th there was all, there's always been a stakeholder in public understanding of science. It's never just completely a disinterested social science topic. There are always kind of players who have got particular interests. <clears throat> So as well as that kind of, you know, quite, quite clear uh, need for productivity, scientific uh, skills, there have been several normative arguments uh, which, which have been raised as to why it might be a good thing that we know about science. Because in general, there's a sort of a, a sense in which, well, we, you know, we should, probably should know something about science, but why should we? I mean, not necessarily. What's, what are the arguments? So some of the normative arguments uh, initially were well, not even initially, but, but <clears throat> very well put by John Dewey, the pragmatist philosopher and educationist uh, in, in the US in the early part of the 20th century. So the idea is that citizens should adopt a scientific attitude to their everyday life. So they should test their opinions with evidence. They should be open-minded. They should discuss things, be rational and critical. So it's a kind of liberal rationalism. So this is the idea that science, the method of science, extends to social life in general. So it's not just about whether you know what an atom and an electron is, but it's actually, do you have a kind of 
scientific view of how you negotiate with other people, other social groups, do politics and so forth. So that's one kind of very powerful argument. I think it's quite a strong, a strong argument myself. Um, now we have science and technology playing a very big role in our lives. We certainly need to know a lot more. Medical treatments are becoming more um, technologically advanced. Our cars, no one understands what's under the bonnet anymore unless you have an understanding of computers. So there's every reason to think that as consumers we want to know about science and technology. And I think these ideas about science literacy kind of mirror more general political debates and political philosophy about citizen competence and democratic politics in general. So the idea here would be, well, if you're an electorate, a member of an electorate, you want to have sufficient understanding of the science to, to understand what are the alternatives. If one party is saying, we're not going to, we're going to ban stem cell research, and another party is saying, no, we're going to go full steam ahead on that, the idea is that, well, you need to understand something about the science in order to make sense of that debate and actually make an informed choice. And there have been all sorts of uh, issues. Uh, climate change is a very, very big one at the moment. I mean, there's lots of sort of debate about science, although it's, I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Uh, genetically modified organisms, nuclear power has come back on the agenda. Stem cell research was a very big issue in the Bush administration uh, before Obama kind of uh, uh, enabled it to, to start to happening again. Nanotechnology, there's been all sorts of uh, potential controversies that we might that, that have entered into politics. So I suppose simply, ill-informed citizens might make bad decisions, because, simply because they cannot connect their own best interests with an appropriate policy position or issue position with the science policy choices. So it makes sense to be informed from that perspective. And this isn't in any way a new thing, although those philosophies and kind of thoughts have had developed over a couple of hundred years. This guy is uh, Charles Babbage, who was one of the first people to envision a programmable computer, although he didn't actually uh, really build a very user-friendly one at the time. Um, he died in 1871. And he wrote a book, uh, Reflections, in 1829 about the decline of science. So people were worrying about the decline of science. As early, I mean, before science had almost begun, you know, <laughs> as far as we can say. So it's kind of... You know, there's always a Cassandra around. Um, and he, his point was, well, science isn't supported by the government at the time because the public's not interested. If the public's not interested, it doesn't really pay much attention, doesn't like it very much, well, OK, that's going to be difficult for science because why should the government do anything if the electorate is not interested? Um, and he suggested that a body be set up to raise public feeling on science. And actually, that is been the nub of the argument and, and, and has driven a lot of the academic debate since then, um, and particularly in the 80s and 90s in uh, social science and in science circles in, in the UK. And so he actually, along with others, formed the British Association for the Advancement of Science, which is now called the BA, and that's still going today and it's still popularising science, it's still working in science communication and I've worked with the BA uh, on, on several uh, projects in, um, in the past. And to bring it up to speed, fast forward to 1979, the Thatcher government came in, reduced public spending on science, public spending on, on many things. Uh, there was a, a worry about uh, kind of a brain drain that was talked a lot about at the time. Uh, scientists going to work abroad. Essentially, scientists felt a bit miffed. You know, didn't think this was such a good thing, because much, much spending on science is public, public money. Um, and so, in response to that, uh, in 1985, the Royal Society set up a working group chaired by Walter Bodmer, uh, and this became known, and not surprisingly, as the Bodmer Report. Uh, and the brief was essentially to look at the extent to which public understanding of science was, was out there, uh, whether, it was, uh, whether it was working well, whether, whether there was any public understanding and how it's distributed, uh, its adequacy for an advanced democracy, and to think about how to communicate science. So here there's very much the idea that, well, science has some knowledge and we want to communicate it and get people interested in understanding it. And that was essentially almost as far as it went. But this sparked off a lot of academic social science debate, partly because it sparked a lot of funding opportunities for social science. And there's always, when there are funding opportunities for social science, funnily enough, there comes up a scientific 
social scientific debate because people are competing for, for science funding. Um, and implicit in the Bodmer report was the idea that, well, it's not just about understanding to kind of, you know, for it to allow citizens to make good decisions. Um, it was also this. So if the public know more about science, they're going to like it more. They'll like what we're doing as scientists, and they'll be very happy to vote for governments who will increase uh, science spending. Uh, not only that, they'll be less worried about new developments, things, scary things like nuclear power and later on genetically modified food, uh, and uh, there are all sorts of other things that have <clears throat> come up since. So that's the assumption. Uh, a more favourable climate for science and scientists. And it's a common sense notion. Well, if you know about it, you know, the truth will set you free. If you understand how it works, often, and, you know, I'm sure this often is the case. Uh, I remember I used to be afraid of flying. And then once I learned how to fly a little aeroplane, or even just had one lesson, I wasn't in any, any way of afraid of flying an airliner anymore. And there really was knowledge kind of set me free. But, but that common sense notion isn't necessarily the case when you look at it over a population. And one of the, the critical things for social science is to challenge intuitive, things that seem intuitively plausible, but actually when you, when you, when you subject them to a critical uh, gathering of evidence and analysis, turn out not to be true at all. So it's really good when we as social scientists have a surprising result. So is to know science to love it? Um, and I suppose this question has framed much of my research. This is what I've been interested in. I'm not quite sure why. I suppose, well, I am. My supervisor told me to be interested in it. Uh, so you know, my advice to PhD students is generally, if your supervisor says, why don't you work on this project? You, know, you might get some money and support and for this if you've got, unless you've got a really good reason not to, do it, because I, it, it gave me a very good opportunity to learn about something I didn't know about and gave me lots of opportunities professionally. So what do we mean by knowing science? And now I'm going to go into how, we, how we've researched this stuff. Well, this idea of literacy has been broken down into uh, three dimensions, three or four dimensions over, over time. And a guy called John Miller, who's one of the key figures in um, US work on public understanding of science, kind of crystallised this. So the idea is that people need to know about scientific method processes, the logic of controlled experimentation, measurement, probability, that type of thing. They also need to know something about the basic building blocks of science, like atoms, cells, gravity, radiation, things that you know, the hard scientist people over here, like, like Jules, and, you know, understand. And us mere social scientists have only the faintest notion of what those might be. Um, but also science policy issues, um, you know, the potential distribution of harm and benefit that flows from adopting one policy or another. Well, this got kind of dropped a bit. And actually, it's really the first two that most of the work uh, since then um, focused on. And defining literacy, it's quite a nice way of thinking of it. John Miller said, well, you need to, the ability to read and understand um, the Science Tuesday section of the New York Times. Well, I don't know if anyone's ever read that. I, I, I've read it a few times. Um, I think I understood some of it, not, not all of it. Um, and by that measure, only about 15% of the, of the US population were scientifically literate. Now, I don't think that threshold measure is rather arbitrary. So that was immediately kind of challenged and rejected by by uh, uh, several streams of research and, and social scientists. But, but the point is it's, it's based on these, these uh, kind of uh, concepts. So how's it been done in surveys? So Jules mentioned I'm a survey methodologist as well, so I'm, I'm desperately interested in how we measure stuff as well. Um, so and that's kind of worked out quite well, because that's all I generally teach at this university is how we analyze data and, uh, and, and measure things. So that's, that's fine by me. And I was able to combine this with this kind of work. So here are some uh, survey questions that I've used and others have used. You know, most people seem to understand the idea of clinical trials in some sense. I mean, there's still a minority of people who, who, who think a better, another way would be better. Um, but interestingly, when, when we probed half uh, those people as to why that was the best method, only half mentioned sort of placebo effects, comparing the outcome. They didn't, there were sorts of all sorts of slightly random kind of responses, and you can read those in, in the welcome report. And in fact, when this question was asked in the, U, in the US on one occasion in 1995, 
about 40% justified this method because fewer people would die if it went wrong. Because if, if you only give the treatment to half them, then only half of them will die in the study. So surveys don't tell you everything you need to know, I mean, with, unless you follow... I mean, so we know that from a survey, but you, that's why measurement's so interesting. You can get it wrong very easily. If you think about science literacy as reading the newspaper and looking at, here's the latest statistics on unemployment or on, on uh, curing disease or f influenza um, you know, spread. Um, so have you a look at this. It's about day-night cycles and where are most of the errors made. Well, I'm not going to ask you over and over again because you're obviously just like my normal class. It doesn't, doesn't want to say anything after a while. OK, well, it's two to four, so it has, here's the peak here, two to four. So, so probably most of you in this room would, you know, if you, if you had spent a bit of time looking at that, because we're scientists working in universities, would get it. But these are all useful things, ways, shorthand ways of measuring public understanding of science. So it's not that you need to understand this chart to know something about science, but this is indicative of the things that you might want to. Here's a final set, and these, these have come, in fact, I was talking about these on the radio this afternoon to Radio Essex, who are asking about this lecture. So here's some true-false statements, and you have to decide whether it's true or false or you don't know. I'm not going to ask you to write down your answers to all of them, but some of them look quite easy, others think, oh, I'm not sure about that. Well, I'll show you that this is for Europe in 2001, I think these data are from, and these are fairly typical of the US, UK, and they've, uh, the answers to these questions have remained much the same for the last 15, 20 years. If anything, the answers have been getting a little bit more correct. Well, that's, that's what we get. So it's kind of interesting. There's about 30% of people think the sun goes around the Earth. And that is quite a constant. Uh, that turns out that that's, that's uh, robust to which continent you ask it in. It's robust largely robust to if you switch the question around and say the earth goes round the sun, true or false, and then you get about 30% of false answers. So it's not just an acquiescence effect where people like agreeing with things or can't be bothered not to agree or say true. And what we tend to do with these in order to use them, it's not, we don't like the sort of headline, I mean, I say we don't like the headlines, but of course I was talking to someone on the radio and then I give them a headline about the earth and not going around the sun or, or whatever, and so they jump on that. The idea is we add these up and we, we create a variable which captures a whole range, so everyone gets a score of sort of 0 to 12. Uh, it's like a kind of a quiz score, and we use that to operationalise that part of the kind of uh, building block of science model. So, that, so this is, these are the way, some of the ways in which in surveys we've, we've looked at this kind of uh, literacy idea. It turned out that focusing on these early on with the Bodmer report and its, and its kind of, you know, emphasis on understanding and, and leading to a nirvana of everyone loving science if they just understood it a bit better, that got labelled as something called the deficit model. John Zyman, I think, coined it and Brian Wynne uh, popularised it in, in the opening um, uh, volume of public understanding of science. And the idea here is that you know, the public are somehow, you know, they're in deficit, they're deficient. They don't know enough, you know, silly public, you know, oh dear. Um, we need to just help them a little bit. And science has got all the answers. Now, it's clearly it's the case that if you look at this, that it, empirically that is, that is so. But I think the normative implications of that have been a bit difficult. And in fact, this, this last survey, which um, uh, Jules mentioned to me earlier, the Public Attitudes to Science survey, which the uh, Department of Business, Business, Industry and Skills has just released this Friday. It's the first time that those knowledge items have actually gone back in the survey after 10 years because the social scientific consensus, which was probably um, you know, hijacked by a particular brand, uh, a particular kind of research orientation, just ruled it out of court to even ask the questions because it was a bit it was sort of an insult to the public to, to test their understanding and knowledge. So, I mean, I, I found that a little bit anti-intellectual in the first place, and that's one of the reasons why I got, got involved in it. And I, I was on the steering committee for that survey, and, I'm very, and I, you know, basically myself and a couple of colleagues managed to get these questions back on, and I'm really happy about that. Um, so this is the idea. We, you know, we, casting the public as ignorant is always a, a bit of a dangerous thing to do because it's much more complicated than that generally. And these are very blunt measures, and in any case, why do people have to know about science? 
It's only scientists saying they have to know about science. Why should they? Um, and so I think it's fair to say the research focus shifted to looking at the idea of trust and why do, you know, what is it, what, what are the kind of power relations underlying science, science funding, um, why should people, it's not that people don't understand the science, they just don't trust the people doing it, the motives, the competence, and so forth. So a lot of research shifted to looking at trust and the basis of trust. But in doing so, my feeling is that they kind of threw out the baby with the bathwater and just said, well, this knowledge idea, it doesn't, it's, it's nothing, it doesn't matter at all. I mean, we shouldn't even be going down that route. It's just kind of silly. And I thought, well, not just me, and me and others thought, well, it seems a bit odd. I mean, we're in universities. It's all about knowledge. I mean, surely it must make some difference. Um, and I suppose what I've done in my research is to respond to that position and then just take an empirical approach to, to, to public understanding of science and just see see what the outcomes are. See, can, can we distinguish different kinds of attitudes and beliefs if we stratify by different knowledge levels and so forth? So I think there are probably two critical papers um, which I've uh, worked on with colleagues. And I've, I've, I've got several colleagues that I've done a lot of this work with, uh, Southampton University, Patrick Sturgis, and uh, people at Surrey and people at LSE. Um, in one paper, we wanted to test this idea of Brian Wynne, uh, something called a contextual knowledge hypothesis, which essentially says your kind of knowledge that you're measuring in surveys, that's not important at all. What matters is other kinds of knowledge, local knowledge, how things work out on the ground, or how things work out uh, in the polity, the wider polity, what people, what, what he called the body language of science. So we wanted to look at that, um, and we, we wrote a paper on that, and and uh, that, that seems to have flown quite well. Um, the next thing I wanted to do was say, well, OK, again, the kind of orthodoxy had been that, well, knowledge doesn't really matter. We know it doesn't matter anymore. Um, I thought, well, I think it probably does. I, every, every analysis I've done says there's some effect. Um, so we decided to do a meta-analysis. And we looked at all the studies, that, well, all the data sets we could find across the whole world to look at this correlation between attitudes and knowledge. So is, uh, you know, to know science is to love it. Is that true empirically across the world, or well, as far as we could go across the world? So that's, that's that paper, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, a third study was about pseudoscience and astrology in particular, um, much more recently, so looking at the way knowledge might, um, science literacy might affect people's belief in pseudoscience, astrology, homeopathy, that kind of thing. And very recently, coming out in 2014, have looked at um, genetic testing, knowledge and religiosity. So, and this study is kind of taking a slightly new direction, which is not just me, there's, there's many people working in, in this area and I'll, I'll explain what that is. And I've got something else up my sleeve, partly um, to do with this survey that I just mentioned, the, the business industry and skills survey, when I'm kind of looking at other kinds of literacy, so arts, arts literacy and science literacy and maybe how those might work together or not. Okay, so the first uh, paper was this idea that it's not knowledge, textbook knowledge of science, it's how science is embedded in institutions, how it's patronised, how it's organised, how it's controlled, who are the stakeholders. That was, that was the kind of key hypothesis for what, what turned people off science sometimes. Or as Sheila Jasanoff said, a keen appreciation of the places where science and technology articulate smoothly with one's experience of life. So how people relate to science in everyday life, not what they know from a textbook. That seems a pretty reasonable thing to say. I don't see why textbook knowledge shouldn't also be, you know, scientific understanding more generally shouldn't be relevant, but that, that, that was not the position. And around this time, there was the BSE crisis. And so I suppose the context here would be, well, math had a conflict of interest. That was the, uh, at the time, I think, the food... The, the ministry responsible for food safety was also that responsible for the producers. So there was a conflict of interest, and the idea being, well, if you understand that conflict of interest, you're going to be pretty sceptical about the science. But if you don't understand that, well, you, you know, you, you're a bit in the dark. And that seemed reasonable. But we thought, well, OK, this might be important, but we still think perhaps uh, textbook knowledge is important. And in fact... What the, what the hypothesis seemed to be from Brian Wynne was that, well, these things contextualise the way you use that scientific understanding. And the idea being that, well, yeah, if you know that 
there's conflicts of interest and uh, an uneven, uneven distribution of, of risks, then the more you know about the science, the more worried you're going to be about it because you know how bad it's going to play out. You know, so that, that sort of, I think, um, summarises the, the, uh, the hypothesis. And there's also a methodological critique, and, and those of my colleagues in the department will know I'm a bit of a um, proselytizer about methods, and I've got you know, some fairly clear ideas on them, and I'm sure they're not always right, but everyone knows what they are, because you know, I, I incessantly bang on about them to my students too, half of whom are here now. I thought that you know, the idea that you could knock out a whole line of research with a, a small number of interviews, and then say that any other kind of way of, of, of understanding this phenomenon was just ruled out of court, was just a bit silly. And I thought that the, the kind of the theoretical perspective was conflated with a methodological one. And we just thought, That's, can't, that doesn't make sense, that can't make sense. So, because Wynn and his uh, crowd were generally qualitative, interpretive, you know, interviewing people on the ground and so forth. So, survey, the idea was surveys, you can't do that in surveys. Surveys, surveys are actually, Kind of, and there was there was a real feeling that surveys were um, they were oppressive. You know, they're oppressive, and they're they're the they're the um, instruments of oppression and power and government kind of. And it's a kind of an odd, it's an odd view somehow. But but that, that, that we felt that was out there. So it's got basically down with positivism. We don't like that. Well, I thought, well, no, up with positivism. I think we've got something to offer here. So we countered that. And what we decided to do, we thought, well, how can we, how can we operationalise this idea of wins, this kind of institutional embedding patronage and control? Well, it turned out that we'd been measuring political knowledge quite successfully for a long time, since the late 50s, when Phil Converse started his line of, of research. And it turns out that political knowledge is, is strongly related to issue preference and... One domain of political knowledge tends to be correlated with many other domains. So if you know lots about foreign policy, the chances are you'll know how many people there are in, in Parliament, and you'll know how often elections are, and you'll know the issue positions of different political parties. And so in the, in the data we had available, we had uh, measures of political knowledge and science knowledge. So we thought, OK, we can, we can operationalise this. We can test this idea, which was kind of... Uh, which was out there and which was gaining ground. So, you know, we thought, well, science policy is a political matter, so we've got measures that we think can act as a proxy for what was being talked about. So we did that, and just briefly, um, the measures were, the political knowledge was this kind of thing. So people were asked, you know, who's most in favour, this, this is in 1996, so who's most in favour of proportional representation who wants to reduce spending? So, you know, that was the Lib Dems, that was the Conservatives, and so forth. So, a similar approach. So, what did we do? Well, I'm, I'm sorry there's going to be some regression coefficients here, but essentially what we did was to say, well, let's look and see the more this, positive numbers mean the more knowledge you have, the more positive your attitude to science is, okay? So, once we controlled for a whole bunch of other stuff, including some of you've got a science qualification, how well you did on that quiz, knowledge quiz score, meant that you were more positive. That's a significant positive um, coefficient. We brought in political knowledge, and it turned out that actually you were slightly more likely to think science was a good thing the more political knowledge you had. So we all kind of thought, oh, that's against, that's kind of contravenes what our expectation here, at least wins expectation. Science knowledge still being uh, you know, pretty much the same. And then we, we tested the interaction of political and scientific knowledge, which means that we're looking at to see whether the effect of scientific knowledge on attitude was greater in some way for those who knew more about politics. So the, the hypothesis would be that the more we know about politics, the less useful that scientific knowledge is and the more that you would become more sceptical because you understand how corrupt it all is or, or potentially corrupt and math and all that kind of thing. But it turned out that wasn't the case. It's actually the other way around. So the more you knew about politics, the more lit science literacy helped you to, in a sense, have a, have a positive attitude. Now, these, are, you know, these aren't causal effects. Of course, someone's going to say, well, how do you know it doesn't go the opposite direction? It's endogenous and so forth. Well, with all those caveats. But anyway, that, that's what we could do. And we tried to sort of have some diagram. I don't know, this probably isn't helpful, but... Um, <laughs> It looks quite nice, doesn't it? I want to have some colour. But this is, this is a political knowledge, science knowledge, attitude. So you can see essentially the slope 
of political of science knowledge is steeper when you are higher up on political knowledge. It's meant to be three dimensions. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the whole box on stage today to, to sort of walk around it for you, but you know, it seems to go down quite well in the publication. So that was what we concluded, that actually, yeah, A, that it turns out that the, the way we've done it, the hypothesis was completely wrong, and, it was the op and, and we found the opposite. But we also made, wanted to make a, a wider point that look, just because you have different theoretical perspectives, it doesn't mean to say that, you, that they, are, they are wedded to any one particular kind of method. And I think we did that quite, quite successfully in that, in that paper. Um, I'm not going to go into so much detail on any, any of the rest, but we did this meta-analysis because we were fed up with people saying, oh, knowledge doesn't make any difference, knowledge doesn't make any difference. So we said, well, okay, let's find out every bit of data we've got on this knowledge attitude correlation and, and see, what, see what comes out of it. And the meta-analysis just allows us to combine all these effect sizes from, uh, of the relationship between knowledge, textbook knowledge and attitudes over a range of... Um, data sets in a range of context countries. And there's a whole literature on meta-analysis, which thankfully I'm not going to go into. Um, so what did we do? Well, we found 193 surveys in 40 countries between 1988 and 2003. And within some of those, there are lots of different attitude scales and some different knowledge scales. So we had multiple effects within, nested within the surveys. We had 499 separate effect sizes. So we did all this, and there's lots of number crunching, and we had a very good PhD student worked on this, who's now, uh, actually, he's, he's really good. He's an academic. He's coming to give a course on multi-level modeling in a couple of weeks' time here. He's now a lecturer at Surrey. Those are our sources, lots of... So it's mainly co concentrated in Western Europe, but we've got some South America, we've got some Eastern Europe, and uh, various other places. So what did we find? Um, well, we use something called a standardized effect size, which is it's a kind of a standard measure. And we, we critically, we controlled for age, education, and gender, because of course, if you know, someone could just say, well, obviously, you know, it's just education is driving science attitudes, not knowledge, because those who are more educated are likely to be more knowledgeable about science, and perhaps it's education that's really behind it. Well, we controlled for that, because we thought that was important, and we were able to do that. And so in a meta-analysis, you like, do so much work, and, and kind of, well, at least by RA did so much work, and you kind of put everything together, do all these calculations, multi-level random effects models, and then you get a result, and it's, it's that number, 0.15. But that was pretty good, and actually, I, was, I wish I'd sort of written down my guess before I got that, because that was kind of what I guessed at. So that that's actually represents the pooled effect size estimate for general knowledge of science on general attitude to science. But what we all, it was more complicated than that, and what we found that actually it matters what kind of science you're talking about. And there's evidence that if you have controversial science, that relationship wasn't there. So it's not as simple as just any science, people you know, like it a bit more if they know more about it. Some kinds of science and technology, the more you know about it, well, it doesn't, have, doesn't, make any, uh, doesn't have any effect, or maybe it could even be reversed. So, that's what we found there. Interesting, there was no cross-national variation really at all. That just shows the residuals from, from the equation. The only outlier is the USA. So they're more positive than you'd expect them to be given their, political, their science knowledge and age gender profile. So that was kind of interesting. It's just one number. But the interesting thing is, well, it's been cited. So it's great for everyone because people who think it's not very important go, well, look at this. It's only 0.15. And then people who think, oh, no, knowledge is important, say, look at it, it's robust across all these countries. So it's kind of interesting, that, you know, there really is more than one spin on any particular result. So um, I'll just briefly go through this one. This is, no, this is plotting no, science knowledge against belief about how scientific people think various activities are. And so this is the proportion of people saying that something is scientific or very scientific, and this is European data from 2005. So this is uh, medicine. makes absolutely no difference, really, how knowledgeable you are about science. Everyone thinks medicine is uber-scientific. Um, same for psychology, so that's good, any psychologists in the audience. Um, but here we've got horoscopes in red, homeopathy in green, uh, astrology, which is the same as homeopathy, we did an experiment, uh, sorry, um, uh, horoscopes, we did an experiment with that. And you see, as 
the more knowledgeable people are much less credulous of these uh, pseudosciences. We also had a question about some, luck as, some numbers are lucky for some people, and you know, that really declined. So the most knowledgeable people with very, very low probability of agreeing with that. So you said that's just a bivariate correlation. That's just our, our kind of basic empirical regularity. Some more regression equations, it doesn't really matter, but essentially we control for all these other things uh, and, and all sorts of other, other weird and wonderful stuff. And the knowledge measures we have, which is the quiz score on those items, uh, a sort of self, um, self elaborated understanding of science, uh, understanding about hypothesis testing and measurement, they all mean you're less likely to believe in. Uh, in astrology, and the same works for homeopathy, actually, in the same data set. So there's a sort of importance there of knowledge for distinguishing between science and pseudoscience and real scientific claims, perhaps. But it's not the only thing. There are lots of other things, you know, class. Um, this was interesting, ob obedience. So authoritarian personalities are more likely to believe in, in horoscopes, kind of. An odd one, that was something that Adorno came up with in the early 50s, and actually that was the original reason why I did the paper. Um, anyway, that's another story. Uh, finally, uh, motivated reasoning. And I said things get a bit more complicated, and that turns out to be true. And the, the more down this line we've got with looking at knowledge and, and attitudes, there's this tendency which is in the literature, which is that people will process information differently depending on what their starting point is. So if it suits some end or goal, if they have some extrinsic goal to start with, knowledge may be deployed in ways which are more convenient, congenial to an existing you know, political value or something like that. And so an example of that is identity protective cognition. So you know, if you're a Republican, you don't want to admit to other Republicans that you actually think climate change is happening because your in-group will then derogate your opinion. That's, that's, the, that's the idea of it. And so, so you start to interpret things in different ways. And we just, we did a paper on this with religiosity. So strongly religious people maybe uh, have concerns about prenatal genetic testing, particularly where it leads to potential abortion. So we, we took this idea and thought, okay, well, what happens if we kind of interact the effects of religiosity and knowledge and see how that affects support um, on, uh, for prenatal genetic testing? So I'm just going to show you a picture here because I think you get the idea. Essentially, this is what we found. So here's the knowledge quiz score here. So high, people high in knowledge are up at this end, and this is attitude to genetic testing, higher, um, more positive attitude the higher you are. So for people who believe in creationism, and this, these are data from the 2009 Wellcome Monitor from the UK, um, people who believe in creationism, the more knowledgeable they are, the, the less supportive they are of genetic testing. The opposite is, the tr is true for people who, don't, who are not creationists. Similarly, we, we measured it on whether you go to church monthly or not. And for those people that go to church monthly, in other words, very, you know, uh, quite zealous, knowledge has uh, the effect, again, of making them more skeptical. And the complete reverse is true for, for, for the effect of knowledge for those that are not so religious. So this is why one has to be careful with this idea. It's not a simple deficit model. It depends on the context. It depends on pre-existing opinions. So that's, that's what we concluded there. So, and this isn't just uh, restricted to our study. There are many other studies that are kind of using this framework. Um, I was able to get some new questions in here, which was pretty exciting, because you didn't have to get a research grant to do it. Um, which was, I suppose Jules is thinking, oh, that's, that's not good. You shouldn't be able to get questions without getting money for Essex <laughs> University. But anyway, I did, so sorry. Um, so here's David Willits introducing it, and it just came out on Friday. I've had the data while I've been playing about with it a little bit, um, and I've not done too much, but we were able to get a measure in, which actually came from a PhD that someone did uh, about 10 years ago at Nuffield College. Um, and measuring cult, uh, artists... Artistic, well, arts and, and uh, arts and music kind of high culture knowledge, because we want to see whether there are still this idea of C.P. Snow's two cultures. And if you're not familiar with C.P. Snow, he wrote, uh, well, he gave a famous lecture in, in the late fifties, saying essentially, why is it that if you don't know any Shakespeare, you're regarded as kind of 
persona non grata in elite circles. But if you, don't, if you can't explain the second law of thermodynamics, meh. Who cares? Well, and that was kind of roundly kind of rubbished by various people. But I, I was thinking, well, let's look at that in the general population. Is it the case that, you know, arts graduates, arty people who write journal, you know, journalistic columns and get the science wrong are kind of a bit more sceptical than, than other kinds of people? So anyway, I've got no results yet, but, but this is the instrument. And I think anyone who came to the graduate conference in sociology will have seen this. So basically, we asked people if they recognise these names and can they correctly put them into these different categories and those numbers are the proportion of people who are successfully able to do that and the idea is to use these as very blunt measures of essentially how much you know about art and music compared to science and of course we've still got the science quiz questions as well so there's a variety of you know it's quite a nice spread hardly anyone knows who mark rothko is that one came in at the very end because they were too easy, most of them. So anyway, I haven't done much with this yet, but the idea is to sort of take this forward and look at other forms of literacy that might interact with science literacy or so forth. So that's, that's pretty much all I've got to say. So the conclusion would be, yes, I think literacy and knowledge does matter for the reasons that I've proposed, and then empirically I've shown that it does have uh, some importance. But it does matter, context matters. And so in some cases, it can enhance the appreciation of science, and in others, other contexts, it can harden opposition. So it's not, a, it's not a simple story. However, it's not enough for social scientists just to say, well, it's all very complicated, so... Because mm. what we should be doing is simplifying things a bit. You know, simplify as much as we need to, but not too much. So I think specifying these contexts and their common features is what I'm interested in doing, and the mechanisms underlying the social psychological mechanisms. I think that's where we should be going with public understanding of science research and where I'll be trying to go. And that's all I've got to say. So thank you very much. Thank you.